Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by Father Patrick, returning guest. And also, he's uh, now going to be on uh, Reason and Theology frequently as one of our contributors, especially to the uh, roundtable discussions. But today, I have Father Patrick on to discuss the issue of development of doctrine in relation to Eastern Orthodoxy. We often hear the term development of doctrine referring to uh, Roman Catholicism, of course, but um, I think it would be helpful to perhaps discuss the Eastern Orthodox view or views, uh, whichever uh, perspective you take there, um, on development of doctrine. So Father, uh, Father Patrick, it's good to have you on. How are you doing, by the way? I'm well, thank you. It's good to be on the show. Excellent. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this. So um, when it comes to development of doctrine, would you say that there is one Eastern Orthodox perspective or would you uh, take the position that there are multiple multiple views on this matter? And, and what is your take on it? Right. Um, I think there are probably a number of different views in, in the Orthodox Church, though there is a predominant view that is some way, um, as opposed to the official Roman Catholic position. Mm -hmm. um, but the, how exactly that is opposed to it or exactly how to define what the Orthodox believe in the terms of development of doctrine is um, probably quite a few views on it. it. It's not something which is sort of being defined by any ecumenical council. So... At, at that stage, in my opinion, anything that's not formally fixed in those in a situation like that is sort of open to a little bit of fair game of various opinions on the on the matter. Sure, sure. And um, you know, let me also at the outset um, perhaps ask. What, what exactly do we mean by development of doctrine? Because in my experience, for, from what I've seen, uh, when this issue is discussed, especially when it comes to Eastern Orthodoxy, a lot of the issue hinges on what do we mean by development? So um, perhaps tell me, what, what is your perspective on um, what exactly is development? Yes, well, I probably myself would don't like the term development of doctrine. So um, I don't really have a, in a sense, a view of development of doctrine in the Eastern Church, though I respect that many areas um, the Orthodox would agree with a, a large overlap of what the Roman Catholic would talk about as a development of doctrine. But what I think in the East is a is a clearer sense of um, the unchanging sense of doctrine, the unchanging tradition. So the principle is that what we've received it remains, you don't add to it or subtract from it. Even when the councils add canons, um, they add another statement of faith, they do so in the context that they believe are not adding or subtracting from the tradition. So any sort of addition is a sort of um, clarification or uh, of the tradition to affirm the tradition that has been received against those who wish to innovate to change or to, to alter it so um yeah 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 i i think um you know, all, all perspectives are definitely wanting to guard against in, innovation. It, it, at least those who are serious about this discussion, don't get me wrong, there there are some people who really uh, are in favor of outright doctrinal innovations. Um, but <laughs> but I, th I think anybody who's, you know, sincere about Christianity is, is going to want to shy away from that. But um, let me perhaps ask it like this, because I think both sides can agree uh, the deposit of faith, that which was once and for all delivered uh, unto the saints, as Jude puts it. I think that we all agree that this was, again, once and for all delivered. Uh, there, there's nothing that you can add to that deposit that's going to be universally binding on, on the faithful. Um, so, But I, I would add this nuance. There were some things that were delivered um, as far as the deposit of faith that were not always explicitly taught, but were implicitly taught. 
Um, so they, they were delivered. The transmission was given, but it wasn't necessarily explicit in the mind of every apostle, for example, on every particular issue. It may have been implicit. Um, actually, it has to have been implicit. That, you know, if it wasn't explicit or I implicit, then it's it's an innovation. Uh, <laughs> would you agree or would you say that no, everything that is ever um, going to be considered binding on the conscience of the faithful had to have explicitly been held by uh, one of the apostles? Good question. Um, yes. Well, I'm not sure if every apostle in a sense um, had every single a detail of the theological nuances and expressions which we've got um, in the ecumenical councils in his mm -hmm. head at any given moment. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, every expression of the faith, every writing that defends the truth, which um, comes ecumenically binding on all, mm -hmm. I don't think that each apostle had that automatically in his head from the mm -hmm. word go and only managed to share most of it, yeah. um, some of it. So clearly there are parts of the tradition in the way of expressing it, mm -hmm. um, which can be put down later and come out. But I do think that we do have the faith um, given once for all, and we are to keep the traditions as passed down. So the, the core set of traditions as in uh, not only belief, but in practice, I, I'm tend to, to clump the two together. So development mm -hmm. of doctrine, again, tends to be the development not only of uh, the doctrines of faith, but of practice as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So that th this is Christ obviously gives them the package almost to the sense that he gives a package to Moses in the Old Testament to in the sense of the, of the law, um, which I pass on um, to us. So, yeah, I, I think the any issue which of tradition and practice of um, faith given uh, a question which rose in the fourth century say arianism mm -hmm. the apostles mm -hmm. would have been able to address that issue mm -hmm. from what they understood say no no that's not that's not correct um so they didn't necessarily explicitly put it all down they didn't necessarily yeah. have every sort of idea in, in their head but the core principles of everything were there and yeah. um i understand that also in the sense that these are divine um, principles so that they're not like human ideas which have a sort of uh, a budding start to them like a sort of undeveloped idea that i think the, the idea is a divine idea the divine principles of of what is true what is practice so so they sense are complete it, 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 it is in a way that is not something that needs to be sort of developed by human growth learning and stuff mm. over ages but again not fully explicitly put down in every detail and everything not every expression of it is in the heads of it, each apostle if that makes sense it, it does and that's the position that i take and honestly i do think that 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 is the position that um roman catholics would would take um as far as Newman's position, I, I think that's the authentic understanding of the development of doctrine, not saying that there aren't Roman Catholics out there who don't believe some kind of aberrant view, but I'm just saying the actual authentic one that has the backing uh, of an approbation of the church, which would be, of course, Newman's understanding, I, I think is, is that, um, that there are things that were implicit in the deposit of faith that are later on uh, drawn out and made explicit. So I, I would say all the pieces of the puzzle are there. They, they were there. <laughs> we're not adding new pieces of the puzzle. You, you, you can't do that. You would be adding to the deposit of faith. Um, <clears throat> if you expect anybody to believe something, you know, and say this is universally binding on the consciences uh, or the conscious um, of the faithful, um, you, you would then be adding something to the deposit of faith if the pieces of the puzzle weren't at the very least there. The, the difference is I think that 
not all the pieces will, were necessarily put together. Uh, some of that takes um, time, and th and that's what we would call development. So um, that's kind of the position that I take. And perhaps correct me if I'm wrong. Let me uh, perhaps put this in the form of a question. Would you say that that's the case with icons? Because that that's at least my impression on the matter. I don't think that the veneration of icons was explicit um, in the first century. I, I honestly don't. Um, but what I do think is all the pieces of the puzzle were there and given to us by the apostles. And it's just that over time, they put those pieces together. Would you say that's correct or, or false? Um, well, it depends. If you take the tradition as true that St. Luke actually painted the first icon of the mother of God. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even sort of understood a little bit in, in Roman Catholic circles. Um I think they've got an icon which is said to be St. Luke in Rome somewhere. Um, then the, the, the actual painting of icons goes right back to the apostles. We certainly see iconographic drawing right from the first, second centuries of the churches if you go to some of the ancient churches that they've dug up. But that would be um, the painting of, of yeah. Um, yeah. artwork, uh, which is different than, you know, the veneration of it. Yes, no, so that's the... So that's, <laughs> painting side of the artwork, the actual veneration side um, of, well, yes, it, it's, it's un almost impossible to tell what exactly people were doing. We certainly know that uh, by the, about the seventh century, they were venerating icons. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons for iconoclasm was that people were going a little bit overboard with the with the um, veneration of icons. We certainly got, uh, I mean, even some early statues mentioned by Eusebius, which were given reverence in uh, its early fourth century. Um, so for want, and we've seen that the artwork is possibly there from at least the second century, if not right from the first century. Um, so yes, and there's no discussion. I've never seen the father suddenly going, oh, well, look, look, what about, let's just start venerating these pictures. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, all you see is that they are doing it yeah. <laughs> later right. on. And yeah. so I, I, I'm someone who's a Are you able to hear me, Father? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my internet decided to jump onto a different. Uh, I can never tell if it's me that cut out or or you oh, know my oh, guess. Yeah. So I I don't know. I, I don't know who it was at this point. I've got about two or three different networks I use for different purposes, and occasionally it just jumps onto a line that's a bit slower. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. So so I I I tend to be of the principle that. A lot, of, a lot of people will talk about certain things developing. They don't see the evidence for it too early on in the church. But once it's put a part of the canonical life, which is such as venerating icons or things like the minor clergy of a church and things, some people are like, they develop over this time. And I think, actually, look at the evidence. There's no evidence that they ever came into being. They just simply were there, you know, in the third, second century. And because they have their canons that sort of say that you should have these orders doing their bit, and they replicate back into the Old Testament orders of uh, the Levites and things, there's mm -hmm. no reason to say, well, they weren't there from the beginning because they, they have a purpose and function in the church. They are part of the tradition of being in the canonical. So anything that's sort of basically in the canons must reflect something that is given in the positive of the tradition. Otherwise, they would be adding something obligatory to the faithful that wasn't in the tradition. So I tend to always say that they those things were there from the start um though we don't necessarily see the evidence of them until later on you would, so, you would say uh, um, veneration of icons is one of those that was there from the start yeah i can't see any reason to say it wasn't because you'd have to show start showing evidence that it was developed later on and um the church is very traditional and you would if anything sort of introduced as innovation or wasn't done before you would expect a huge <laughs> roar of <laughs> protest um among the fathers and such a silence is quite normally you wouldn't take the negative <laughs> as being positive but but just the silence on things which are potentially innovations i think is quite telling 
Um, so exactly what was happening, how they're doing it, how it manifested, I'm not sure. But I, I couldn't say that it wasn't there from from and, that, and things like um, the handkerchiefs, um, mm -hmm. the fact that they took like the Peter's chains and and mm -hmm. kept them, the um, the sort of the, the very holy items right from the word go were kept, it's like relics, etc. Um, were kept and venerated very early on. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's very early. Even you've seen that in the scriptures, um, the sense of veneration of relics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, so. And and I get that. And, um, you know, I'm not absolutely opposed to the view that perhaps these things were there in, in the first century. But here's why I'm very, very hesitant to to go with that, because I do think that we see positive data from the fathers indicating that they abhorred um, anything that even resembled what we would consider the veneration of icons. Um, some of them were very much against even just artwork itself. And then those who affirmed artwork give no indication that there is a veneration, but there's there was much pushback um, from some of the fathers on having any kind of artwork or any kind of appearance of idolatry. So I, I would say that that's evidence that I think that, no, it really wasn't there. If it was, it was very uncommon. I think the common perspective was they weren't doing these things. Uh, some were very much against artwork. Others were in favor of artwork, but for pedagogical uh, purposes and not necessarily for veneration. And it was only later that we understood, uh, based on certain things that were given to us from the apostles, that veneration of icons is uh, not only permissible, but should really even be the perspective that we ought to uh, adopt and that we should be doing these things. And um, I, I, But I think that requires development, e even the appeal that you make to relics there. Yeah, we see relics very early on, and we do even see veneration of relics, but, but that's a little bit different than uh, a painting, the veneration of a painting. And so to map that on, from relics to a painting, I think is logical. I do think that it is legitimate to make that connection. But what I'm saying is I think that that requires at least a degree of development to, 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 you know, connect the dots there. I think when you're doing that, you are doing a certain form of development. Would you disagree and disagree and say that? No, that that's not development. I can understand what you, you're saying. Now I'm just throwing it a different way of interpreting it. And yes, as you say, we, we just, there is like a positive, and there are some fathers who object to it. Now, if we're coming from a Judaic background where veneration of images was a, a major no-no, um, so this would be a quite a jump. So yeah. you could reframe it that yes, it's okay, but in the economy of the church in the early days, this was not something um, done overtly because it, it was um, the practice of something that when the church matured so i do accept the sense of a maturity of church because you see this in the canons the church has matured to such extent now that we're allowed to this or that to take place mm -hmm. um which means that the common that the, the faith in the community takes time to settle into the community that the habits of faith once they've been passed on five, six, ten generations, mm -hmm. become far more fixed in the in the church society. Whereas in the first generations, you, they, a lot of people when you come in, they, they're still influenced by Judaic thinking, pagan thinking, and yeah. so the church would say, or well, the fathers would probably go, "No, we don't want to rush into venerating icons because you've got idol worship, you've got all this thing going on." So, in a sense, the people not ready for that full expression of the of the faith so you might get a few doing it but as the church matures people are comfortable in their christian faith they're quite clear and not idolatry worshiping idols etc then that then the manifestation is allowed to take its full fruit within yeah. the, within the faithful so in a sense it's not a development where oh look this is a good idea we can start doing this as well it's more of that as the church matures that these things are sort of the economy of how their manifest is opened up and 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 freed out um and therefore yeah, yeah you sort of see it growth over time but I, I would say not in the sense of developing an idea oh well, well we can actually do this as well it's more that it's now the proper time that this is done freely and openly 
I, I would get that in the context of Jews. I totally get that. Um, but the, the early church became pretty uh, you know, non-Jewish, if you will, uh, pretty Gentile pretty quickly. Um, but even in those periods, even prior to uh, Nicaea too, but after really, you know, the majority of Christians now being Gentiles, we still don't see it. We still see it fought against. But that's um, what, partly because there's so much idolatry around. You're right. Yes. Like, and and, and, and I counter to idolatry is a little bit of a yeah, in, encountering pagan idolatry, and, and and I get that, but it's it, it, here's the thing: whenever these fathers were addressing the issues, um, this was a perfect time for them to say, you know what, we can't do this, we can't do this kind of idolatry, but here's what we can do, because in other areas that did somewhat resemble paganism, Christians were still okay with, okay, well, we can't do this form this particular act because it's pagan but we can still do this and, th and they would kind of give a nuanced view but you don't hear them doing that with icon veneration i really don't see it uh in, in the early church fathers and most of the quotes that you know people appeal to are, are generally spurious or um out of context so when you would expect them most to tell us well okay yes we can't engage in idolatry but here's what we can do they they don't say it and and i find that that's a very um very loud silence <laughs> i think that it's it's definitely a difficulty especially coming from a protestant background that was a major hurdle for me um so you know what what would you perhaps say to a protestant who says look to me this sounds like innovation to you know the veneration of icons to me this sounds like innovation um, I don't see it in the first century. I don't see it in sacred scripture. So I, I think that you are adding to the deposit of faith when you engage in the veneration of icons. How would you defend it uh, against the charge of innovation? Um, <laughs> Without development. The only way I know to defend it is with authentic development. Um, and I can give the reasons why I think, well, here's the pieces of the puzzle that we all agree are there. And here's how they work together to give us this. I yeah, can do uh, that. Yeah, we could, <laughs> we could go down the theological. I mean, I, yeah. I come from a Protestant background as well. And I just found veneration yeah. icons came along quite naturally. Once, once you sort of got the theological hurdle over what was actually going on, then it became quite, mm. quite clear what um, that, that was perfectly fine. Um, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, iconoclasm, for example, comes about because the idea that it wasn't right. It was sort of done as um, many people were doing it. It was, it was sort of become customary. But clearly up to that stage, they hadn't. No one had sort of laid it out in, in clear terms. So, um, And you do get the, the teachings about, well, you shouldn't draw an image, et cetera. And, um, both that, of course, the cross had been so well established as an image to venerate that even the iconoclast couldn't remove that symbol from for that for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think you can talk about it in terms of the the theology of it, mm -hmm. and as again, I, I still think you could talk about the lack of evidence in the sense of um, the economy of it. And that you do get fathers who object to it, and that's fine because the, um, Orthodox or Catholic, or uh, actually, I'll just I, I like to say Orthodox Catholics because I mm. consider myself a, a Catholic Christian. If we're talking about the Catholic Church of a, a historical sense, sure. we're Orthodox yeah. qualified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Orthodox um, Catholics, so I just. Um, lost my train of thought well, you know it's it's interesting because if you look at the eastern orthodox documents or the the official documents of the eastern orthodox church they don't call themselves eastern orthodox they refer to themselves as the orthodox catholic church um yeah. so I, I think that's a legitimate term to use and and anybody who's confused by it um maybe has some misunderstandings well yeah. uh, the point i was going to say is that we're still very heavily um the scriptures are our our foundation documents as such and so it's not surprising that you'll get bishops presbyters and stuff to look at the scriptures and, and sort of raise the question 
um, as each generation receives the faith, not everyone instantly learns everything about the faith. Every, even today, every person who converts to Orthodox Catholicism as such has to grow in understanding all its details. And so that was true in those days. And if things are not explicitly written down uh, as today, there are rooms for disagreements, rooms for different opinions, etc. So um, we do see that in the fathers. There will be some that will go, wait, hey, what's, what's this going on? It's because it's, it's, the prima facie looks like it's contradictory, the Lord's commandment. Mm -hmm. Why are we now set free? So um, they're partly with the economy approach as well. And then um, the, the issue didn't really get hot enough to be explicitly argued out until iconoclasm came along and really threw the, um, <laughs> the span in the works and it, it really forced um, people like St. John of Damascus and the, the, the Studite to, to really hammer out the, the defense of the icons. Um, so, um, yeah, so I still don't think you need to go to a sense of development as um, people sort of going, this is a good idea. Um, it sort of more grew organically as, as such. People just started doing it and people didn't, some people sort of questioned it because they wouldn't have questioned it unless people were actually doing it. Um, and um, the, the, the early voices didn't seem to have a huge impact on its continued growth. Um, so, um, yeah. You, you mentioned an interesting um, uh, phrase there. You said grew organically, and, and that, that would be the um, Catholic understanding of development, that this is an organic growth um, To um, when, when speaking about development. So um, could you maybe tell us what is not an organic growth? What would you say is not um, a legitimate development, even though I know you, you don't use the term? What would you consider an innovation? Let me maybe put it that way. Something that you would say this couldn't be considered development if you're going to even use that kind of term. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of times we are actually sort of agreeing. We actually do agree with things. It's just um, it's where we draw the line of, as you say, what is development? What right. is the line we draw around development? Yes. So when I hear yeah. development, I'm immediately concerned that it opens the door to an ambiguous ambiguity of change yeah. uh, now that may not be the rc the roman catholic position but i still um, uh, uh, just to talk about it in those terms yeah. unless you 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 start with very clearly we receive the body of faith which doesn't change and uh, um yeah. it is passed on from time to time um so innovation well i look at some vince's rule but i don't look at it in the normal sense of everywhere and um, anywhere and try to find that any doctrine has been taught everywhere and mm -hmm. at all times. What I use it is in the reverse, that if you can sign something which you know has only been taught in one place or at one time, then this is very likely to be the innovation. So what we're doing is not trying to find any doctrine and say it's been, you can see it everywhere. You, you're just saying, if I find a doctrine which, which I know is not everywhere it's only in one place only at one time then i've got this as a innovation. Well, wouldn't that work against um your your position as an orthodox when it comes to the essence energies distinction because i do see that in the cappadocians um in in a form uh, not exactly as articulated by palomas and i'm not saying there's not an organic development there uh, i'm just saying um you usually see it in the Cappadocians. You don't generally see this um, in the Western fathers who who are still canonical saints in Eastern Orthodoxy. So when, when you say, okay, well, this particular issue is kind of local to them. So by that argumentation, wouldn't that be, then be an innovation? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to take it. Uh, Stop. I don't uh, think that it's that an innovation. I, let, let me get it. No, 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 I'd agree with that. Yeah. I, just, uh, um, I haven't thought through, thought yeah. through, thought um, through that. And I, I don't think there is a, um, a clash with what in the Western Fire, but on that specific mm -hmm. point, I'd have to sort of re 
go through all the western farms and see what they exactly yeah. said before i can really make a, a statement of what Fair is enough. or what isn't there or is or isn't localized right uh, so an innovation well area was an innovation i suppose um all the classical heresies that say oh, christ um mm -hmm. is not the um, is just a creature he's not the mm -hmm. uh, eternal son of god um so that that's something new that comes in and obviously end up fighting over it but it's, it's interesting though we'd call it a heresy and an, and an innovation many of the church bishops and faithful thought it was actually the true expression of the of the faith um so it, it, it dominated for a long time so it gets very tricky when we say it's an innovation doesn't mean it doesn't catch catch fire or the fact that what has been received as in all places sort of thing as a general is so well understood or known that mm -hmm. um, people sort of go oh no no it can't be everyone can immediately see it as <laughs> the innovation yeah. um yet it is well enough known by sufficient group of people that um there is a defense that comes up against it sort of thing um in the sense that uh, from Narcius and and he wasn't the only one were standing against arianism even though many many had sort of gone with it um so yeah it's just I, I can't really explain more than that. That's when we talk about it. You know, um, the, I, yeah. I guess the the way. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something other, uh, oh, additional there? Talk about innovations. I mean, that's sort of a dual doctrine. Or, or um, for a, another classic um, case, is sort of the introduction of unleavened bread. Okay, would be some another innovation I would consider where everybody was using leavened bread. All of a sudden, in the ninth, seventh, eighth, ninth century, somewhere, someone in the West starts thinking this is a good idea. We'll use unleavened bread because of the symbolism, or whatever. So here we've got a, a, a localized change, a, a innovation in the, in the common custom of everyone was using leavened bread to start with. The Armenians are actually is a localized usage of the um, unleavened bread, which was condemned sort of at Trullo. But then it suddenly it took off in the West post that, you know, eighth, uh, ninth century. Um, again, but you can localize that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see in the early rites that everyone was using um, living bread. And then you can sort of point a date and a time where it starts becoming a practice. They might legitimize it for, for one reason or another. But you can sort of date it that this started happening at point X. All those things that you can't really date, you just have to say it's an ancient practice sort of thing. Those things, which, um, as I said, like the establishment of readers and subdeacons, the um, icons, you, you can't really sort of date it when suddenly in one space at one time this thing starts being done and then spreading out across the rest of the churches. It sort of disappears into some sort of vagueness of, mm. of time. So I think, yeah, that's a way of sort of looking at it is can we start date? and fix a time and a place and location where this thing started happening. And if we can, then it's likely to be an inno innovation. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that sort of disappears into the murkiness of history. And, okay, it's a good chance that it's part of the tradition. If it's still being done now, we've got evidence it's been done at other times, and, and it's likely to be part of that, the, the common tradition. Well, you know, it's curious that you're bringing this up. Um, you, you know, for one, I'm... I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the history, but it seems like I've seen some patristic citations um, where they were uh, speaking about unleavened bread. I could be mistaken, but I, I want to say that I've seen some in the third, fourth um, century. But but maybe that was an anomaly. Um, you know, it, perhaps it wasn't indicative of, of what's going on in the majority of places, even if it's authentic. Um, so it doesn't really subtract from what you're saying, but I, I guess I'm very hesitant to, to concede that at the oh, moment, no, fair enough, fair enough, fair uh, but, but what, you know, let, let's, let me go ahead and, and just accept it just hypothetically. Let's, let's say that, you know, it, it was an innovation. Let's say that, you know, the use of, un, uh, use of unleavened bread is a liturgical innovation. Um, I think that you could also find liturgical innovations in Eastern Orthodoxy, the very use of, 
uh, some hymns that are not part of scripture, you know, things that are that are not part of the Psalms. Uh, that, that was quite um, a scandal at one point to start allowing uh, liturgical hymns into uh, the liturgy. So, yeah, OK, let, there, there might be a degree of liturgical innovation. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's essential to the faith, that, that, that there's a major problem here, because I would say that there are some things that could be innovations, quote unquote, um, and there that are legitimate, that are OK. Um, and then there are some innovations that, no, you, you can't do this because you're now adding to the deposit of faith. So I wouldn't see, for example, those liturgical innovations, if we're going to call them that, as, you know, hindering anything in the deposit of faith or even adding to the deposit of faith. Would you agree or disagree with me on that one? Um, partly agree, partly disagree. I think there are certain, this, well, this is where some things get difficult. It's, it's mm. um, what is actually something that did matter. Yeah. That, um, the, the form of the bread being bread and not as I'm, um, mm -hmm. did matter. Christ actually chose Arton. He chose leavened bread. And, and well, that's it, what the gospel writers do. They, the, the Greek is quite clear that if he's using unleavened bread, they call as I'm, they don't just use bread for it. They use a completely different word, unlike English. Um, so um, the fact he used the word for leavened bread is what it means for what he's offered tends to imply that this uh, from the orthodox argument you, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that the, this the use of the living bread is actually part of the, the the mystery it was part of the tradition for this to be used so when you're innovating on this you actually innovate against the received tradition of the the material to be used um it's the same baptism we have triple immersion um mm -hmm that uh, to be changing the form to a single immersion or just sprinkling somebody this is changing the, the received form so these and in orthodoxy i think the 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 material form is as much part of the tradition i think you do start seeing this is a little bit earlier on even in the western thinking of st gregory the, um, the great even st leo a little bit compared to the east where the east is much stronger on the actual physical forms of what was going on west was much more slightly more spiritualized in the sense of oh well the form doesn't matter quite so much as long as the, the faith is correct sort of thing whereas in the east oh no 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 you must get the form right as well as a, as well as the faith um so the, the two are going and uh, this does diverge start diverging i think earlier on and it becomes a different mindset um, this is why I've sort of lumped the traditions of the canons of the traditions of the practice with the doctrine. I don't divide the two into one's a preserved, unchanging thing and the other one's variable, changing, depending on, on time. The, the, the two are a, a biggish package um, that come together. Um, yes. <laughs> no, I, and I hear where you're coming from, but it, it's curious because I would I would have actually used the very same argument against the Eastern Orthodox position. But I, I mean, not, not that I'm trying to argue against it. I really, um, you know, I, the position I take is you could use either. But um, if I were to try to argue against the use of leavened bread, I would have appealed to Jesus. I would have said that what was taking place is the um, he was celebrating the Passover and he was transitioning this into the new covenant. And during the Passover that you would have used unleavened uh, unleavened bread, I believe. Um, so I guess what evidence you 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 use some grammatical well, evidence? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's right. It's your, your classic arguments. Like, well, he ought to use unleavened, bread. but no, because in the, the gospel they actually say Arton. If if he had actually been using the azimes, he would have said he picked up the azimes and and gave it to. Him. So so that was. It's not like in English where you use the word bread and right, sure, sure. sure. Bread. In, in Greek, sure. You, you'd use azimes if you meant unleavened mm -hmm. bread, you'd use the word azime. If mm -hmm. you meant if you use arton, you'd mean leavened bread. The, the two yeah. words are uh, different. So in, this, in the New Testament, when it says he picks up arton, then they mean leavened bread. Now, this was one of these things which he's introduced to the new, new covenant. He's doing something quite different. Yeah, it's possible that that's legitimate. I'm, I'm not saying that he had to have used unleavened bread. Yeah. It seems that that would have been more in continuity. Yeah. Um, but, 
the, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I see where you're going from a gr grammatical perspective. Now, my challenge would then be to perhaps show uh, differently when it comes to the grammar that's using there, which, I'm, of course, I'm not prepared to do at the moment. But I, I will look into it and see, OK, um, does that term have to mean that or are there perhaps other uh, extra biblical uses of the term where it perhaps referred to unleavened bread? I'd, I'd have to look into that. So, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. but you, you, you know, you would make a very strong point if that word necessarily means leavened bread. Uh, okay. You would, you would have a point and then you're saying, okay, look, this is the practice that Jesus gave to us. So your liturgical innovation here is now contrary to what Jesus gave us. But here I would turn it right back around and just say, did the um, apostles perhaps deliver to us any liturgical hymns um, apart from these Psalms? I, you know, some can make the argument that what's going on in Philippians uh, two is this was a Christian hymn. Perhaps, I don't know if this was used during the actual liturgy, um, but it, it seems like what we received from the apostles w during the liturgy was the use of psalms, not hymns that we make up on our own, which are later on used in the liturgy. Am I wrong there? Um, well, the, the Psalter, the Sims of um, Psalms of David and the other ones where we call the Psalms of David. Yes, they become the principal music of the church, plus of some of the other canticles, of course, of um, Moses and the, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. There's a few other canticles, obviously, which go through all the services, um, both in the, in, during the Lord's, um, you'll get the, the, the various uh, Western Rite canticles each day and then and, during Orthodox or Matins, of, they have the same, actually about four of them are exactly the same canticles, um, but they do all of them each day sort of thing, except in Lent, where it's much more like Western practice. Um, mm. Plus you get the Song of Zechariah, which is a New Testament hymn, which is, becomes part of it, and of, of, the, of the Magnificent, of course, for sure. the God becomes. Sure. So, but that's um, part of scripture. So, so the the challenge is this: to use something extra biblical, Old Testament or new, um, well, as far as the, the scriptures when they first started the, the hymn of Mother of God. I mean, it's only panned down as scriptures yeah. by Luke and stuff, and it's, yet it's been sung before. The, it, you can say it's the official acknowledgement of his gospels mm -hmm. and things of it. So they weren't just using, because uh, obviously in the first century, you would have been talking about scriptures, you mean the Old Testament and these right. other new sayings have just been put down. Uh, do they get the same um, category of qualification and things? Um, so I, I think overall, by while the Old Testament forms a core of it, then you've got the New Testament hymns that there's no, in principle, there's no reason why over time, the, the Holy Spirit, um, that more specifically Christian hymns, hymns um, dedicated to, to saints and stuff cannot be added to to the, the deposit of, of hymns. And yes, I do realize in the early church the, the, that there was some reluctance mm -hmm. to add many of them in. Mm -hmm. And my own personal thing is I think in the East, now I'm, I'm disappointed that these other hymns have sort of re place the psalms quite often that the, the, the psalms like for the lords um the praises they mentioned uh, just the bits from between the other hymns um and actually the odes or canticles have been almost completely re replaced by the canons to a degree but they've forgotten that the actual canons were meant to be dispersed within the odes um and now they've got all sorts of interesting little refrains that they're putting in between them so so in eastern practice i, I could sort of criticize a little bit maybe go a little bit overboard with um with the hymns but nevertheless i, I don't see as any reason why as the church uh grows that extra hymns cannot be approved and used for liturgical the holy spirit's still there in a sense of um and these are not sort of adding to tradition because you need to honor honor the saints and create correct him for that saint you can't just go to an old testament and pull out um a necessary psalm verse for it but um yes having said that they should be developed with a certain sense of um 
refrain from letting everybody and anybody add what they whatever they like. Yeah, and, and you know, I I do get what you where you're coming from, and and again, I I accept the use of him. So I'm I'm just kind of arguing here for, um, when when we're talking about perhaps liturgical innovation of, um, unleavened bread, perhaps trying to make some parallels here. <clears throat> I get what you mean by, uh, the New Testament hymns before they were codified, as part of Scripture, they were being used in the New Testament's liturgical life. So I I get how you would say that. Okay. Well, that there is precedent for it because it's not scripture yet, and yet they're doing it. Um, but uh, I, I would I would still say it was still Theanustas before, um, you know, before it was codified, and yet our liturgical hymns are not Theanustas. So I, I would say that there there still is a distinction there. Yes, perhaps there was a time they had not been codified just yet. Um, but again, what makes them different is the Anustas. So I, if I wanted to take a really strict position, just say, you know, the apostles didn't deliver uh, this idea to us that we could use hymns that are non the Anustas. I know how absurd this is starting to sound, but I, I'm just trying to show that, you know, I think that we could I, I still make this parallel. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I still think that there's perhaps a difficulty there, and that's why you do have so many people giving pushback whenever you do have the introduction of hymns into the liturgical life. Um, well, it, yeah, yeah, it's. I suppose um, you can. Uh, it could be done another way, of course. Again, the, the hymns would have taken time to write for the new ones, so um, you can't sort of possibly could say, "Oh, just imagine here's a whole lot of extra hymns to to, to sing." They, right. they, they go on and i think quite rightly i would inherently be opposed to people putting new hymns and um left right and center into the services because they take on a sort of sacred form and who are you to start writing a hymn which is going to be right. sung in in church sort of thing so you'll, you'll actually find a lot of hymns to saints are all the same hymn just different names added right added in so i'm not surprised to see sort of that yeah. breaks been constantly added to these um hymns and um but i i don't think that it's necessarily in a sense there is a develop david wrote hymns and david wasn't the only one to write hymns other writers after david um added a few extra hymns which are called the psalms of david mm -hmm. i mean majority of them are david's but it didn't mean others couldn't contribute to that body of music. Um, so sure. don't think yeah. there's anything like that. The, the, that sense of tradition of people writing hymns by inspiration of God, um, and it's not just restricted to only he wrote all the hymns for the entire church or the entire people of Israel and stuff. No, there are times where God... Um, but but in a, in a sort of there are principal hymnographers who are who who always got inspired for that job to contribute hymns to the church, um, and yes, not everybody anybody can just throw in what they right what, yeah. what, they, what they like yeah and and you know I'm singling out of one one particular issue there's many others I, I would say if you look at the byzantine liturgy today and you compare it to what the apostles gave us as far as worship i think it's a legitimate development but i think it's just that a development i think there are liturgical developments there um would you disagree and say no there there are no liturgical developments there well clearly you cannot talk about as saying that this liturgy which is performed in constantinople today came hot off the press on the apostles pens no <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that's right <laughs> clearly um and the long alterations change or um um and the de and develop in, in a sort of external sense so mm -hmm. yes i i couldn't say anything mm -hmm. otherwise from that um is it but in the sense but say compared to the new order mm -hmm. I think there is a uh, consistency. For, oh well, or some of the practice I can sort of grumble at and say, "Well, you're not actually being consistent here. You should return to a better way you do the liturgy." So, mm -hmm. um, so I think the Russians and the Athenites sometimes look at some common pra parish practice and, um, yeah. and 
Greece, or especially if you get over to the US, where the sense of tradition is probably even less founded and the people just sort of start chopping things out. Um, so there are some real issues about where the development goes. And so it stays within this sort of content framework of the liturgy um, has a certain entrance to it. It has the readings. It has the prayers of, a, well, it's supposed to have the prayers of the Smiths and the Catechumens, um, for penitence for the, um, for the faithful. Then you've got the offering and then you've got the preparation and, and the partaking of communion, then the Thanksgiving. And you see this in all the rites. Uh, basically the same um in the west some of these things started dropping out earlier um when i think the, from the eastern perspective the, the west started to do some massive liturgical innovations from the ninth century mm. way before the new order <laughs> sort mm. of the question thing like losing the catechism and prayers and, and losing a lot of the litanies um out of that was sort of but especially with catechism and prayers is one way that Laodicea says we must have these in the in the in the liturgy sort of lays down a canon that this is and orthodox service now still has all these components so you have to sort of look for them a little bit carefully but they're, they're basically there um so in, in that sense in, in fitting the framework of what is expected in the liturgy i would say it hasn't changed or added anything to that framework it's but there's the lit because uh, I accept legitimate development in the sense, and I think this is a, a, a point to bring out, is that we have a church tradition which is common to all places, but um, God doesn't want to just dictate us and micromanage every detail of our, um, Christ our, our Christian life. And so in every place and time, the human congregation, ha uh, the, the hierarchy, have a right to their own rule of the church, the rule of the tradition, the rule of the faith. So within the framework, they can develop their own customs. It's, it's quite legitimate to, and so we get a variation of customs. We get a sort of a development of customs as long as they stay within the circle of tradition. So we've got to distinguish between what's the, the allowed human custom which we accept and mm -hmm. obey because they have received it from the elders as well and what is the the parameters of tradition uh, which cannot be changed cannot be given over but yes you can you can develop and customize within those parameters um and and we receive and follow the, the customers and we can complain if the customs start breaking the, the parameters. So you start chopping out the catechism and prayers, for example, which are in the canons to say we must keep it. Then your, your custom is going across and then people can start going, hey, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and start complaining about it. <coughs> uh, so yes, so where it's the, the human custom as a um, quite legitimized custom within the framework, yes, we should see lots of development, lots of difference, lots of changes, as humans have the right to to express that to fit it to local conditions you've got different ethnic ways to fit, fit your local customs your so the, the, the faith becomes truly embedded in humanity humanity in the in the tradition it's not something sort of imposed this sort of, and unfortunately where so trent went is trying to remove that to the objections of a lot of the Gallicians and and people like that where you say oh what are you doing the, the centralizing position of the same details and orthodox is no no <laughs> you so yeah anyway i hope that helps <laughs> yeah I, I think you're making a good point because what, what you're saying is yes there is a development in the liturgy but it's not um the same sort of development or innovation as the use of um unleavened bread according to your position you, you because you're you're saying that the development here is now going contrary to something um that jesus and the apostles gave us whereas the developments that you're referring to are authentic because they're not going contrary to anything that the apostles delivered is that a fair summary of what you're saying yes, yes. Okay. And, and, and this opens up there there's always a gray area of what and we can have arguments about yeah. what is it that the apostles have delivered what yeah 
what is custom. So that, that, that's you know, open argument. So quite often the, the so-called arguments between Orthodox and Roman Catholics and may not necessarily because it's developed. It's actually what has developed, what has changed, rather than the process of whether it has developed or changed in, in itself. Um, so, yes, it would be wrong to say an orthodox position was there's absolutely no change. Everything has just been given to us on the tablet from the apostles and we're doing it exactly as they gave it to us. No. Sure. <laughs> when it comes to those things that are our, our freedom yeah. of custom, as I said, there's plenty of development, plenty of change. But where it comes to those parameters of the yeah. tradition. Yeah, and, that, and that's where the... Anything. Well, we, we, think we haven't. Yeah, that's where the rubber meets the road. We we all agree there's development. It's just how far does that development extend? Uh, where are the parameters? I, I think that's definitely where the discussion is. I, th I think that, uh, you know, those who would just say there's no development at, at all, <laughs> I, I think, you know, really, uh, I, I don't know how anybody could really take that, that position. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and I do think that that's definitely where the uh, battle battleground is. Let me ask you about a couple other doctrines um, in Eastern Orthodoxy and get your take on them. The essence and energies distinction. Would you say that there is a developmental aspect to it, or do you, would you say that the way that uh, Black or Nay um, defines it, if you will, or approves of it? Uh, I'm sorry, not uh, Black or Nay, uh, but the councils of Constantinople. Um, I do want to get to Black or Nay on the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's the other doctrine that I was going to ask about next, but one at a time. Essence and energies, the councils in Constantinople uh, surrounding Palamas, when they give their approbation on the essence and energies, are they uh, approving of something that did develop um, over time, or was this exactly what the Cappadocians were saying, and perhaps even what the apostles are saying. Well, I, yeah, I, I take it that um, what they were defending is um, th what the Cappadocians were saying um, is absolutely consistent with what the apostles are saying. I just think theologically, it, you, you you have to make this distinction between God's um, essence and His actions. Um, otherwise, you can't even have creation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the problem is, uh, yeah, we, we all agree that there's there's continuity there. I think where some of the development takes place is how we would understand these things, where, where it comes to created energies, uncreated energies. What is an uncreated energy? I, the, I, I don't really see some of these things being as articulated as, as clearly oh, okay. as they are in, in Palamas, yeah. you know, in the Cappadocian. So I, I do think there's some development there. I'm not saying it's illegitimate. I think what Palamas is doing is he's looking at the Cappadocians and, and making some development there. I, I, mean, I wonder if he's, he's also, the, 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 I would say that the non-energy position, I think the, the absolute divine simplicity and that some of the issues that were raised in the West were starting to, um, which were influencing some of the Eastern thinkers, mm -hmm. were, were the innovations which Gregory Alamas yeah. was fighting against, was mm -hmm. that the idea that we have created um, this sort of in between God and man is just some sort of created graces and things like this. And it's like, whoa, what are you talking about? I mean, everyone has just assumed that when God acts, God acts. God is in his act and he, he does just that when um, we see the, uh, the undivided light, you, you, you know, the apostles saw the divine light mm -hmm. as, as such, but they weren't looking at the essence of God. Um, they were looking at, uh, and that distinction becomes necessary because, I mean, to, to see the essence would would be to be God. I mean, uh, to, so you do yeah, no, no, and, and but you're not looking at something that's created. So you, you have to have this. I think this makes absolute sense to me. And so I, I think creation was when people started trying to say that God is just essence, just something like that. And then, well, how does he connect to humanity? And then trying to do some sort of created in, in, intermediary and stuff. Yeah, and that was that was therefore forcing uh, St. Gregory Palamas to um, counter that and develop, it was develop for <laughs> yeah. well, express, uh, express what I think everyone has already believed implicitly. <laughs> that, and that's what I'm getting at. 
And that's what I'm calling development. And I think that that's what a Catholic would call development. Because here, here's what I'm saying. I think these things are implicit in the Cappadocians. And what Gregory is doing is he's making them explicit. And, and I'm not saying that he's doing so illegitimately. I, I'll go ahead and concede that he's doing so legitimately, um, it, you know, unless proven otherwise. I'll accept that this is a legitimate, um, he's explicitly articulating what was implicit in their thoughts. Um, would would you not say then that 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 then is still a form of development? It's it's just simply that as I say the category that everyone just that's what everyone assumed it was the case until someone started to argue otherwise, and then okay. then um, you have to sort of express yourself and 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 contrary because the other person comes up with these reasons and says well actually um, if you take this and this and this you've got to have this problem and this problem therefore. Um, we must have created energies because uh, you've not actually seen the divine because if you did that, you'd... So that they've got a bunch of reasons. Therefore, you've... And this is like Arian says, well, if you if you have this, this, and this God, then you have this problem here and, and confusion. And so you need to then counter those reasons with contrary reasons. You've got to start expressing the, the theology, the reasoning behind it um, to, to overcome it. And because we, we are humans, we are the people of logos the people of reason that um the, it's not just simply imposing someone no you must believe this you've you've got to actually come at them with reason counter reason with reason so therefore obviously an innovation set of reasons mm -hmm. need to have what's a, the assumed receipt of faith reasoned mm -hmm. out and um, so this creates a sort of a, a development of expression of um a, a logic etc which wasn't expressed earlier as as you are as, as the body fights a, a, an infection sort of thing it creates new antibodies to, to, deal, to deal with that the body hasn't changed really it's, but is uh, having to, to adapt to work on this new invasion sort of thing so yes now i'm, I'm very happy to so if you want to call this development, um, yeah. I, 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 where, where it gets concerning to me is that someone at the 11, 1200 says, oh, this is a nice idea. Let's start talking about energies and essences just completely out of the blue and and say, and it's sort of almost a sort of um, speculative yeah. ideas adding yeah. in and stuff. Well, well, we'll start believing in this now. No, I reject no. that. The, yeah, the, I, I don't think it's that kind of development. Always to believe. <laughs> no, I don't think that essence and energies is, is that kind of development because you do see the distinction being made in, in a primitive form in the Cappadocians. Um, you can arguably see it in 681 implicitly. I believe it's implicit. I don't think it's explicit there in 681. Um, but I do think it's implicit. And in fact, that's actually what um, Constantinople appealed to was 681. Um, for the essence and energies distinction. So, <clears throat> and, and you can find Eastern Catholics who, who, you know, perfectly are willing to concede that. So I don't think that this is something that it's, that is really contrary to the Catholic position. Um, but I mean, we could get into the absolute divine simplicity, essence and energies issue, uh, in detail no. another time, but not, not to derail it. But, uh, but my, my point in bringing all of it up is I think that what's going on is amongst the Cappadocians and the sixth council is the, some of those things are there implicitly, the pieces of the puzzle are there. And then what Palamas is doing is he's, he's kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together and, and, it, and the pieces of the puzzle weren't made up by the Cappadocians or 681, but they were delivered to us by the apostles there's just thousands of pieces of the puzzle and the, the fathers and you know palomas are beginning to put them together that's the way i would see it and and i would call that development um and and i think that that is the way newman would would understand development but perhaps some you know if, if you could correct yeah, me on no, that. i mean I, it's this is where what are we talking about and what is yeah the, and i think in the from what I've seen, from what Newman and, and, and you've stated, we have ninety-five percent agreeing on the same thing. It's yeah. just a couple of points where, it's just some of them. Yeah. where the what is the tradition, what is sure. it? It's, it's a, a, a bread tradition. Um, I also think for another test case is an orthodoxy. Once the you've got the creed put down, I know we've had a little bit of this. this, this 
debates about this. But once you put that, once you've actually explicitly written some a, a statement of faith down in, in one of the ecumenical houses, that's not open to rewording or um, change. That that stays. So whatever is talked about in the future must accept that wording as it is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the same as scripture. We don't rewrite the scriptures. The scriptures are there. They, 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 they are a stable thing. So whatever we talk about theologically, we must remain consistent with mm-hmm. what the scriptures. And again, I believe in reason. I believe that that, um, that once you get enough information into place, it's very, very hard to start to have contrary ideas. I think once, well, that's why even if you take the Seventh Ecumenical Council, for example, there was the, the, the Constantinople Councils, but it's very hard to sort of talk about um, accepting the seven ecumenical councils as the Orthodox Church does without being Orthodox. Um, or there's, I can't think of any other sort of group who really believes all those, which is another religious body, which is not Orthodox. And it's, it's, so there's enough parameters in there that <laughs> you haven't got much wriggle room if you want to be true and consistent. If you if you're given to truth you might close your eyes and block to, to something like that but mm. when it comes down to it the, so i think reason can be parameterized reasonably effectively um so um that you don't need a sort of external necessarily authority as a <laughs> catholic said that once you get enough material there it gets really hard to sort of be consistent with it all <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. no, no, um and reason and the other one, is, as I said, is the, the tradition of practice that also the, the canons can't be changed. Mm-hmm. The, the, you must be consistent with the canonical tradition. So if the canons say in Nicaea 20, you should not kneel on Sundays, then that's it forever. That, that is the tradition of the church. That's not up for change. So if you if you so later on say, oh, well, we're changing the canon now, we allow you to kneel on Saturdays for prayer, no, for me, that's that's changing tradition. That's innovation. That's 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 not to be touched. So all the canonical traditions there. How you act, practice it in economy is sometimes uh, enforceable strictly history, but you don't change the the canon. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or uh, yeah, no. uh, you can sometimes qualify the canons because yeah. certain circumstances, because a general canon needs to be qualified for specific. I want you to have absurdities coming along. You've got to create the general canon to, to cover everything, to cover all the little gaps, but you, then you've got this, let's go, right, for this specific information, we don't do that, we're going to have an absurdity. That's reality. It's just it's human. Yeah, yeah. The economy is it changing the rule. The rule is still there. It's just, are we going to enforce it or not? Yeah, based yeah. On and, and change is not also qualifying the rule for specific circumstances, not changing the rule either. So so people who've got a very black and white sense of change, oh, look, someone made a qualification, well, therefore they changed it. No, the, the rule still applies as it is, but except for this circumstance here, which is a qualification. It's not a change. It's not an adding to the rule. It's it, it, at any stage, it probably would have always been accepted that. Um, so yeah, so I, I think some people people get too, a little bit too black and white. Yes, if developments, mm-hmm. everything has been handed to you as a matter of fact, no, sure. <laughs> you got to pull over. But so, uh, once something so, has been in the ecumenical council put in black and white then this is not up for change. So this is one of the orthodox, like the scriptures, you can't go and change the scriptures. You can't change the canons mm-hmm. or the, 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 the creed of uh, Night Fist Nicaea. You can't change the um, tome of St. Leo. That has to be accepted as a statement of faith. You must accept it as he's written it. So you can't be a mere physite. And if you reject the the, DFI, the physite terminology, you've rejected the faith of the church. You've got to accept that. As it's written, sort of thing. You can't say, "Oh, we interpret it in a way." No, you've got to accept that <laughs> as mm-hmm. it's given, because that's the positive of faith now. And once it's explicitly put down, it's not up. So, where development has to be constrained by these fixed points, in a sense. You know, it seems like it, it may have been Hilarion, um, but it, it, it seems like he was indicating that some of the canons could be. Um, I don't know if he used the term lifted, but when it comes to the Oriental Orthodox, um, that that perhaps the, they they could be 
uh, lifted some of the ones that uh, apply to them as long as they affirm that their theology is not contrary to uh, the dogmas there. Um, I might be misrepresenting him. It's been a while since I looked at the article. I need to go back and look at it. But I do know that he was allowing for, at the very least, some change to an ecumenical council because he starts to use the letter to Mari from the EBOS as an example, and he used a few others. So I know I know he was affirming in principle that there's some aspects uh, that can change to an ecumenical council, but whether or not he specifically says the canons can be lifted, don't quote me on that just yet. Yeah, but no, no, no. I mean, there's quite a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a, I'm, I'm sort of quite a traditionalist in this sense. Mm. Um, so what would you maybe take so issue? I'm very strong on the, on the sense of the, the, the tradition and practice and, and, um, and theology more than many, uh, a lot of orthodox. So yeah, this is where I'd probably, take a slightly more right wing for one of but I, I did that on basis because I, I when i came out of protestantism I, I was finding that um it was becoming a free-for-all like they take the scriptures oh we'll interpret it in a cultural manner so therefore the scriptures only applied to that time and that place and i just found this well once you start going down this path you can just justify doing whatever you like um because once you so, but when I read the scriptures, you know, receive, take the traditions and hold on to them fast, just as we've delivered them to you. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the traditions as well um, are not about humanity. The traditions are there because of the church is the body of Christ. It is Christ. And the, the traditions, the canons are, the, are to protect Christ being Christ in this world. Um, and so they're, they're not there about our just incidental workings. They're about, as I said, Christ being, in a sense, present in the church, continuing us. And if you start changing those, you're effectively changing the body of Christ. You're, ch you're changing how Christ acts, how he's expressed in the world. And you are almost, it's, it's interesting for Canon 1, which I found interesting of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, says he like he, he referred to as preaching another gospel and i thought oh hold on a minute well, you're just talking about canons here but in a sense if you're starting to distort the reality of christ's practical a tangible presence in the world via the church sort of thing then you are preaching another gospel you did this is a different christ um which is before us. so i'm I, i've seen these things in a slightly more not just simply discipline of the church which comes and goes but something deeper than that that is protecting the reality of Christ in the church is, in a sense, a tangible, tangible way. So uh, it, it's a life. And so when people talk about, oh, this is time and place, well, actually, no, Christ is the same today, yesterday, and everywhere. And um, these traditions reflect that and the mystery of our union with him. And so that's true for everybody. It's, yeah. it's always been the true every place. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> so that's the way I'm sort of coming from. Yeah. And, and the, I understand. I, I want to ask you a couple more questions and then maybe we'll do a couple of chat questions and wrap it up. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask involves um, kind of bringing it back to a doctrinal perspective when it comes to development of doctrine. Um, there are some things that are taught explicitly in, explicitly in Scripture. There are some things that are taught implicitly in Scripture. And when you perhaps... Uh, combine, if you will, those things that are taught explicitly and implicitly, you can get certain conclusions. And then also you can find some things that are in divine revelation, either explicitly or implicitly. And if you combine them with something that we know as a fact, historically or by human reason, not, not speculative, but we, we know it. Um, when you combine something that we know as a historical fact or by human reason with something that is in sacred scripture, um, you could call that a development. Would you accept those conclusions that necessarily follow from combining those things? Or would you say that, no, we, we can't accept that. That's innovation. That's not proper and legitimate development. Oh, and I, let me give you a concrete example that I've kind of used yeah. in the past before um, when it comes to something that is in divine revelation and then something that we know by human reason. Uh, one of the examples that I like to give is, OK, we know by divine revelation that Jesus is fully man. He's fully God and he's also fully man. Everything that it means to be human, he is capable of doing. 
Um, but one of the things that we don't know from divine revelation, but we do know from human reason is that uh, humans are capable of laughing. Uh, so but by nature, this is something that's characteristic of, of humans. Um, therefore, I think that we could say legitimately that Jesus was able to laugh, whether he not, whether or not he exercised it, I don't know, um, but he was able to. And in fact, this conclusion could be so far extended to say that if you denied he was able to laugh, I think you're now denying what is in sacred scripture, um, what is implicit in sacred scripture, if you will, what, what has been revealed to us. Um, this, I think, would be a, a theological conclusion, a legitimate development. Um, would you say, no, that's not a, a development, that's an um, innovation? Um, if No, I, I, I would, yeah, it's, we would, if that's what you mean by the, <laughs> and that's key and because I'm happy with the sort of the, the sense of reason on scripture mm -hmm. again, um, not every little detail is um, put down, and and I yes, there is scope for um, reason to be applied on onto these things. I don't call this as, as development, as mm -hmm. so long as the reason is consistent. Exactly, with, exactly. With, 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 we may have big arguments. Was consistent. That's might where maybe where the difference is. Yeah, <laughs> everything goes to account. So for laughing example, you can say yes, but then when you say, well, how do minute if we start talking about the passions, uh, mm -hmm. how much laughing is to do with mm -hmm. the passions and, and things like this, and um, therefore you, you might have to qualify. Yes, he has the capacity, but he, mm -hmm. he, he may never exercise it. Um, he's got a capacity to swear, possibly, <laughs> but he'll mm -hmm. never do, do that because it'd be contrary to his piety and things like that so so to be this is where the reason has to be um carefully <laughs> used. sure yeah and we would have to carefully walk walk this thing through but this is where some catholic doctrines come from they're called you know virtual um conclusions or the theological conclusions um they are virtually revealed um be because it's combining something that has been um, explicitly or implicitly revealed in in um, the deposit of faith, and then combining it with something that we do know uh, by human reason or perhaps um, a, a historical fact, um, and then that conclusion then can be binding on the faithful through the authority of the magisterium or or the church that has the authority to declare those things definitively. So some some of the doctrines that people um, might be concerned about actually are, are theological conclusions that come from that principle. But we would then have to prove that, okay, it actually is a theological conclusion. It's not something that we're speculating by human reason. It's more than speculative. It's something that we actually do know by, by reason. Um, so these are some of the things that when, when Catholics talk about development, in my understanding, these are some of the, the ways in which uh, development is understood theological conclusions and, and so on I, what i find perhaps um where i would get a little well there's there's two issues one is um some of these things becoming binding on the faith or rather than just left mm. in the mm -hmm. theological opinions um mm -hmm. start to put it sure. the, the, the lifting of it, that um if if it's necessary and then and the motivation for doing that so i i think orthodox would be reluctant to just oh yeah to to say sure oh, well, this is an idea well let's now make this binding on the yes that, that's a whole different <laughs> discussion yeah if on the other hand someone's like arius is coming along saying crisis and then you have to use the by reason etc and, and using human language on who's yours let's use this mm -hmm. word because that captures uh, that will destroy his arguments and that captures what we need to do to say as a church is what we what we believe yes this, this is okay this is this is fine and this is a, is a bit of a combination of that re reason using what the human language is and stuff there which is not just in the scriptures i know a lot of our fathers com were complaining because it wasn't in the scriptures so um that'd be, but just to go and create binding doctrine on the faithful just because it happened to be a good idea that <laughs> <laughs> well, the, yeah, I think yeah, we all the, 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 have so much put down. Is I like a little bit of freedom in this to have 
and, and not to, to, to put the too many parameters down, um, yeah. and especially if there's no need to do that. Um, yeah. And yes, yeah, so that's and also we've got the issue of who can put that down. And I yes. think this is, um, one of the big differences in the way of the understanding this development is you've the Roman Catholic, the, the magisterium, which can determine mm -hmm. these things. Orthodox mm -hmm. don't. Orthodox right. have the ecumenical, which are irregular, uh, extraordinary events are not part of the institution of the church. Yeah. Uh, in, in a sense of a standing thing. And what they do is not so much come together and sort of uh, give an authority that this is what we believe. They, mm -hmm. they provide a testimony to a witness to what we've all received. Um, that's what they do. They gave it all the bishops. So this is what sure. we received. How do we best express what we've received? Is yeah due to the issue. Um, so the, the fact that you've got the sort of magistrate that can sort of put these doctrines forward speaks in itself a little bit of a, a slight distinction between the way the development is understood that there's some authority that can say, now we actually believe this as well. We'll make this official doctrine, which in the East, with it, no, we don't allow really like that idea. Of, of doing it that way, that's going to be beyond what the sense that we're just defining yeah. what we received and 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 finding things to counter someone who's objected to what we've received or try to throw an interesting new interpretation of it, which is not up to not up to scratch. So yeah, we, we, I think in the practical side of that, we we're, we'd be sort of saying no, we don't want this idea. Well. I think that the mag magisterium is is proposing this as something that has been received, and it's been received through divine revelation and natural re revelation, um, the, the pieces of the puzzle being combined there. So it, it's been received, but God has given it to us in two different modes, two different ways, one through divine revelation, one through natural reason and natural revelation. So the the, the council or the, assuming the magisterium is operating through a council, the magisterium, when it proposes these things, isn't, isn't coming up with them, but is saying that this is what we have received. Now the question is, do they actually have that authority? That then takes us to, you know, a, the different discussion. But for the yeah. Catholic who, I, who already... I, I tell you, this is what we've received as such. Um, the desire to sort of make explicit or as, as a magisterium for the faith or the binding. I, I still find that process of something troubling for me in a, in a sense. Um, and I think it's very subtle. It's hard to, to define it distinctly, but 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 there, that's sort of where I think that where the differences development sort of are manifested at, at, a, at a more practical level is that yeah, the North Fox would feel uncomfortable that even though it's claimed this is what received and this is developed, that they need to do this or that they want to um, say now we're all going to believe this. To me is suspicious it's, it's a sort of a, a level of development i'm not happy whether they're just sort of adding things to the positive of faith sort of thing when it's not actually just simply a reaction and a clarification against a massive heretical push um that that's that needs to be that needs to be addressed because it's ripping the church apart <laughs> um sure yeah and just that motive and what's going on there. I can't really explain it, uh, articulate it perfectly. But I think, I, you I think Newman agrees with you. N Newman actually was saying, you know, why, why are we addressing this issue of papal infallibility? Because um, normally when we have an ecumenical council that addresses something, it's when there's a big controversy and then a need for it. So one of his objections was there's really no need for this. Um now, so yeah, I think that that in principle we we would you know be able to agree that you know ordinarily the magisterium should be definitively settling things only when there's a need, and for the most part, it generally only does when there's really a need. Uh, you could argue some exceptions, sure, um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, kind of kind of wrapping this up here, I wanted to ask one more thing that you said. You you mentioned uh, Saint Vincent of Lorenz. Um, earlier, I wanted to ask you, what do you think he means when he uses the term progress? 
And he says, is there not to be no progress in religion? And he says, of course there is. Um, and he kind of uses the, the acorn into the full tree Newman kind of analogy. He, he uses that idea as well, if I recall correctly. Um, when he says progress there, how do you understand progress? Well, I, I sort of touched on it earlier, where mm -hmm. each of us individually, as it goes from child to man or from convert mm -hmm. to, to faith, we have to progress. We, we start from a limited um, perspective. We have to learn. We have to grow. So each of us individually progresses into the into the faith, which, um, just as all our forebearers have gone and grown into into the faith. Mm -hmm. Then, as a community, the as I said, the establishments of Christian behavior, Christian um, practice, um, in a sense, progress so that. Um, the sense of the early Christians have you know, a simple command structure to, to follow. Then as they got in the habits of faith, etc., you can sort of become a little stricter, a little bit expand out the, the horizons to the, so that the fullness of the potential of the practice of the church can be manifest at a community level. Um, so again, this can be true if a mission comes into a certain place. It can take time for it to progress. To so you start with little mission parishes and things like that. The people uh, sometimes maybe start with a little bit of their own custom, you know, sort of previous customs and things, until they start growing in the faith. Until you can get enough people into it, you can develop the, the fullness of a liturgical thing of the, the massive uh, cathedrals and the full full liturgy at the start. You've you've got to do things at at a quite a basic. Level. So there's, there's a sort of a progress as it moves through society. There's a progress of how um, you start with a pagan Roman Empire and it takes after Constantine comes in freedom of religion, then it progresses to the next stage where it becomes um, enshrined in law. And then you get Justinian who's creating Hagia Sophia sort of thing as, yeah. as a pinnacle of the Christian church. As, Sort of thing. So this is a sense of progress as, as Christianity moves through society and it, it fleshes out its its existence. It's, it's still teaching and preaching the same thing, but it's the, its effect on society and our ways of life, etc., is and can be progressing. <laughs> but he, he speaks of progress in the context of doctrine there. In doctrine. I thought he did. Am I am I mistaken? I'd have to go back, but I thought it was in the context of doctrine. Right. Um, well, as well, I'm not quite so sure we, 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 if it's just doctrine. So yeah. that's how I've interpreted it. So I'm, I'd have to go back as well. Yeah, I'll need to uh, say it's doctrine. Uh, yeah. yeah, we can talk about that. Um, well, again, individually, as I grow older, I, my sense of doctrine gets better as I study more and reflect more and um, things. It's not like as soon as I come a convert, the whole tradition is sitting in my head and go, oh, I know everything now. <laughs> no, <laughs> it takes growth. Um, and so also for local churches, um, we all grow into it. So and it's, it's even the bishops and presbyters it's not like you suddenly get ordained and suddenly wham oh i know everything <laughs> no so <laughs> and so you might find that um certain local churches etc may not have got the fullness of the faith there they they may have got sidetracked by little um odd practices and things um they need to learn more the, and more gets fleshed out more gets written down so there is a sense of progress as a, the fullness of the tradition sort of gets a bit more put down, articulated as as all the challenges come up um, with it. So I think what I, what we've both agreed with is uh, the all um, the challenges of just the humanity. Just the apostles couldn't write everything at once. Um, the idea which I'm trying to write was fully there. So we're not starting a new idea and go and making it grow and people thinking about it and how I, but mm. the expression of it, the um, articulation of it, as it hits situation to situation, of course that, that grows. And we've seen the ecumenical councils, we've got the creed in one, we've got a second creed in the next one, we've got the um, the letters of the 12 chapters of Leo in the next, and then you've got the tome of, these are all, 
progress in in the, the, the things that we've got to articulate faith. So, um, yeah, and I think that's acceptable. It's all about mm. protecting that the deposit. Um, but yeah, the, how sure, we do it. sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, here, here's a question. This one comes from Jared Dobbs. This I, I would assume would be for you. What is the most recent legitimate development in doctrine in Eastern Orthodoxy? Would you even accept the, the way it's phrased? Maybe not, but, uh, yeah. How, how would you answer that? Um, what is the most, well, I think recent. If, if we're going to talk about the, the sense of what we've agreed is, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then I think the the last fully accepted sort of ecumenical council would be the um the the ones of constantinople in the 1350s of, yeah. uh, with the essence and energy distinction yeah. uh where where it's sort of articulated that so in a yeah. sense of defending against those who object to the divine light being an actual vision of god um but not his essence, uh, and yeah. the only way to explain is through his energies, essentially. Um, and that's what the saints actually partake. Um, and yes, th that would be, I think, the last one where it's commonly um, get accepted all over. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say, too, 1351 um, on the essence and energies. Uh, that I couldn't think of anything more recent when it comes to development of doctrine in eastern orthodoxy um i don't see any other questions at the moment so we'll go ahead and wrap it up we're at an hour and a half so we'll, we'll go ahead and call it here thank you again so much for coming on looking forward to have you on i want to say is it might be in about a week or so i want to say it's next saturday we're going to have a round table so, yes, no, it's been good. I hope yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to that. And I think we're actually, you're also going to be on for the Filioque. Um, I know I have it listed on the calendar. I don't have the date in front of me, though, but I, I know it's listed on there. And it should also be in the YouTube section for the upcoming streams if y'all want to take a look at the date on when Father's going to be on uh, talking about the Filioque. So much more for from Father Patrick to come. So again, once, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on. Truly enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed it, too. All right. oh. Everyone, thank you. Everyone, uh, appreciate you all watching. Um, everything that you do to support the show, please comment, like, uh, subscribe, share this material on your Facebook, Twitter, uh, Discord, whatever, all that good stuff. Uh, help spread the word. And uh, until next time, God bless you all.